But good to see everybody here today, and I hope everybody's well when we stay that way. And the uh, Lord will continue to protect us and lead us and guide us. And we're thankful that His holiness surrounds us. Amen? Yeah, because we need that. So uh, today we're going to be going through the latter section of chapter 2 of Ephesians. Um, so if you want to turn there, I got a, a bunch of uh, text I'm going to go through this morning. Try not to overwhelm you with all of it. But uh, last time I um, got to teach, uh, it was a communion Wednesday. I guess it was May. Yeah, this is June, right? So uh, yeah, I think we just had communion. Um, so I think it was May. And, and, I, and I went through um, the first part of Ephesians. Uh, but I started off in Galatians uh, chapter 1. And I'm going to hit that again. I want to kind of do a review of where, where we were, where we got to, so that we kind of have some context of what the next section that we're going to be covering is about. It, it, you know, the next section in, in Ephesians 2.11, which is where we're going to start, the, the first word there is, Therefore, and and if you don't have the therefore, if we don't know what the therefore is, therefore, then it's kind of hard to understand, you know, what what he's talking about. So, to get to the therefore, we're going to back up to where we went and what we went over, and I'm going to, you know, try to go over it pretty quickly and just brief over it. So I'm going to mention a bunch of scriptures and and. Um, I might read some of them. I, I might not. I might just comment on the scripture. Um, you don't have to try to turn there to keep up. If, if if you were here, you probably will remember, and you'll be able to, you know, connect the dots and remember where we were. If not, there's always a recording you could go back and listen to the whole the whole uh, uh, teaching if you would like. Um, but anyways, uh, we're going to start back off, and I'm going to start back off in Galatians 1 and 1 to 5, which is where we started, but not before we ask the Lord uh, one more time, surround us with your presence. And, and, Lord, just lead us and guide us and touch our hearts, Lord, and just draw us to you. We, we so need to be drawn to you. We give you thanks and praise. And, Lord, may the blessing that you bestow upon us today carry through our lives and, and just bless someone else, one another, uh, in the unity of your spirit. And, Lord, uh, may the way we live our lives be a blessing to you. Touch our hearts in that manner, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, in your precious name. And, and let me start by, I almost forgot, uh, wishing you a happy Pentecost uh, Sunday. If you didn't know, today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, Pentecost is um, the, I guess that would be the fourth um, feast of Israel. Uh, and it is it's Pentecost. It's the Feast of Weeks. Uh, it is seven weeks plus one day, 50 days past Passover, which is today. And that commemorates, and this is actually a good topic, um, it commemorates um, the, the giving of the law when in the wilderness wandering, when, uh, when Moses was on Mount Sinai and he was given the law and he, he was coming down the mountain and what, what was going on? Uh, yeah, yeah, the golden idol, the golden calf, and, you know, the idolatry worship and everything that was happening there. And Moses, you know, threw the law down, and, and the law was broken. And if you remember that day, 3,000 perished um, at the breaking of the law. Well, then, Pentecost Sunday, after the resurrection, at the Passover resurrection of Jesus Christ, it was uh, Passover Sunday, it was when they were meeting and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church and 3,000 were saved. Uh, and, and so... It commemorates, you know, the breaking of the law that we could never keep um, and, and basically the death that was going to come to us uh, because of that uh, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the pouring out of his Holy Spirit and the new life that was given to us through him. And that's what we celebrate today. And the w wonderful thing about that is, is, is that, you know, when God created us, and I am way off on a tangent here. <laughs> so, so this is, I, I told Darren beforehand, I said, I keep this so I don't do this. So, you know, I, I, can, I can follow where I'm going. Um, but here I am already. I haven't even started. Um, you know, he created us to have unity with him and be in perfect harmony with him. And, and that was obviously Adam and Eve in the garden. Well, that didn't last. Well, we don't know how long it lasted. I shouldn't say it didn't last long in the, in the you know, in the, in the Bible that's very short. Um, and there was a, uh, obviously a breaking of fellowship between God and man, and unity was then gone. 
right? There was no more unity with God. We was broken and, and death came upon man. And it was the giving of the Holy Spirit that reunited man and, and God, right? And, uh, and so that's where we're brought back together. And we're going to be talking about unity today. So that's, that's actually a good topic. Um, so with that, I need to move on. Uh, but happy Passover Sunday. <laughs> Not Passover, I'm sorry, Pentecost. Yeah, see, there we go. Happy Pentecost Sunday. So Galatians 1. In verses 1 to 5, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever forever forever and ever amen um so we, we asked the question grace is from who grace is from our lord jesus what did he do he gave himself for our sins and why what was the purpose uh, to fulfill god's will which was to deliver us from this present evil age and we tagged off that um <clears throat> we talked about uh you know god's will and his will being done and we were connecting what i was trying to attempt to do was connect uh, being in God's will and the hope that we have from being in God's will. Um, so we talked about some, some different aspects of God's will, things we know about God's will. Uh, when the disciples came to, to Jesus and they said, hey, teach us to pray, he gave them the, the Lord's, what we call the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So it goes on from there, but, but he taught them to pray God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. And we, and we commented on that, that Jesus knew something about that. He wasn't just telling them to pray a prayer that was, hey, pray God's will be done. Because it wasn't very long from that time when Jesus found himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was praying, Lord, if there was any other way, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. Right. And so he knew that and he knew what was coming. He knew, you know, the anguish and the pain and the separation from God that was going to be coming from that. So he didn't tell them just to do something that he wasn't willing to do and lead in in himself. Um, <clears throat> and in, in that prayer and giving of himself, he gave himself for our sins and ultimately delivered us from this present evil age. This present, I mean, it's very clear that we live in a present evil age, isn't it? Um, and then we talked about some different aspects of God's will and what does that mean. And we talked about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, right? And that you should um, flee from sexual immorality. And we talked about that, that one particular one in God's, you know, God's will being done was that it was a cooperative um, a cooperative aspect of his will, right? That's, that's what his will is for our life, but we have to participate, right? We have to submit to what his will is. It, it, it's not just a unilateral. It's like, this is my will for you, but are you going to walk in that? Um, and and God's, God's will for our lives is never, I mean, it can be restrictive, but it's never restrictive to oppress us or stop us from doing something. It's protective. And as I was thinking about this yesterday, because this, you know, I've had people ask this to me, actually a family member asked this to me um, about, well, you know, being a Christian, can you do certain things? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can't, can't you, oh, you can still do that? And it's like, of course we can do that. I mean, it's, God God's not keeping us from being able to live a life or enjoy a life. It, this is really no different than than something like, you know, something as simple as you walking across uh, a busy grocery store parking lot with your child and holding its hand so he doesn't run out in front of a car. You know, I mean, is, wouldn't that make sense to you as a parent? You're not going to just let your kid run free through a busy parking lot, are you? So that's, that's not to restrict them or burden them or, or keep them, you know, oppressed. It's for their protection. That's what God's will is for our lives. We have to be willing in certain cases to to cooperate with God's will, right? Because it's, he's, he's doing it for our good and for our protection. But then we looked at God's basically unilateral will for our lives, something that we don't participate in. And we went through the first part of Ephesians. Um, actually, we went through pretty much all of Ephesians doing that. And I'm not going to read all this for the interest of time. But if you were to go back and look at um, the first part of Ephesians ch uh, chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, 
you'll see some of the things that God said about his the exercise of his unilateral will in our lives. Uh, and I'll just recount them. He blessed us with every spiritual blessing. This had nothing to do with us. He chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. He predestined us to adoption. He accepted us. He redeemed us. He forgave our sins. He, he revealed to, his, to us the mystery of his will. He made us an heir of his kingdom. And he sealed us with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. Those are the things he did. It says that he did for us in the beginning sections of Ephesians chapter 1. In the second section of Ephesians chapter 1, from verses 15 to 23, in Paul's prayer, he said, he asked that the Lord would give us, uh, said, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This is his will, that he would give us the spirit of revelation and knowledge of him. That our eyes of our understanding would be enlightened that you would know the hope of his calling, that you would know what the riches of his glory and the inheritance of the saints, and, that you, and, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked us, worked in Jesus Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Another working of his will. In chapter 2, in the first 10 verses, he said he made us alive in Christ. He said he raised us up. And why? It says that he might reveal the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness for the ages to come. We took all those things and we said, this gives us great hope. Knowing that God's, all these things are God's will for our life. And it's his unilateral will for us. He worked these things on our behalf without us. And before the foundations of the world, before we ever came to be, he worked these things out on our behalf for us, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that ought to give us great hope. <clears throat> and it continues on, and it says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to perform good works works that he created for us beforehand that we can't take credit for, things that he did prepared in advance, his workmanship, his poem. It's like, it's like almost like you think we're a painting, and, and, and he has a clean canvas now, not spotted, not stained, a clean canvas that he's writing a new story for each and every one of our lives. He's writing a poem. It's his work that he's created for us to walk in them. And in that, we now have great hope, hope abiding. It's, and we talked about that difference in hope, and we've talked about this many, many, many different times in, in, in this chapel and from this pul pulpit. This is an empty hope. It's not like, you know, um, I'm going, I'm, you know, hey, we're going to go fishing today. Are you going to catch any? Hope so. But you really don't know, right? That's not, you, you may, you may not. Uh, there's a lot of things that are like that, that you, you, you might hope so, but there's no foundation, there's no grounding in that hope, right? But in his workmanship, there's great hope. We have great hope because he's done all these things for us in advance. And now our hope isn't grounded in what we've done. Our hope is grounded in what he has done. And it's a firm foundation that we can rest in and we can grab onto it. It is that confident expectation of things that will work out for us because he has done it. It made me think of, you know, our having trying to help, or you think about people in whatever, in X number of different religions that are out there, our belief systems that are out there. And, and they really don't have any hope in them because all those belief systems are really based on the foundation that it's man trying to reach up to God. And I can't reach that high. And I'm going to stumble along the way. And so really the basis of that hope is empty. It really doesn't hold any hope. But our hope in what God has done is the fact that he reached down to us. And he grabbed onto us. And he held us and he pulled us up. All these things that he has done for us. That brings us great hope. And so now we can turn, turn to Ephesians chapter 2 as that basis and that background. <clears throat> In verse 2, 11, it starts off with that word that I said, therefore. And the therefore is all what I just shared. All these things that God unilaterally performed on our, our, on our behalf to give us a great hope. Therefore. <clears throat> 
He says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. There you go, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who hath made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So this is what Paul has done. He has basically now turned to unity. The unification of the church, the Jewish believer and the Gentile believer. And Paul, he spoke a lot about unity through his teachings. And I'm just going to recall a few of them for you. You don't have to turn to them. But the first one is in 1 Corinthians. You'll remember the, first, the, the, the church at Corinth. There was a lot of divisions in that church, right? A lot of things going on that he had to correct. Um, but he said, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. And you remember what they were doing, right? I'm with Paul. I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ, right? So you had all these people that were going off on different fractions. Uh, now let's think about that in today's terms. I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Lutheran. Oh, I go to a non-denominational church where we do nothing but teach the Bible. Right? So you can see the division, right? And you can see the division that was going on there, but you can see the division in today's church just as well. It's here just as well as it was then. Um, in Philippians, in chapter 2, he said, If there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship in the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love of one accord and of one mind. And let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. And he goes on from there. But he's telling, he's telling them, be like-minded. You know, we have to quit thinking separately and thinking about the things that divide us. Let's think about the things that brought us together. Because the church is, it, it's so easy for us to, to divide ourselves. It's, it's often said that, you know, the, the church, you know, shoots its wounded, you know, before anybody else would ever do so. Um, and, and the church is not supposed to do that. The church is supposed to be a hospital that brings people in right, to heal them. Um, but later on in Philippians, he actually mentions two by name, right? He says, I implore you, I implore Eudia and I implore Sintichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. So we had another, a, a, a difference of a mind, a difference of opinion. It was causing some division that Paul had to address. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, just a couple chapters from here, he says, I therefore the prison of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And then he goes on, there's one body, there's one faith, there's one baptism, right? But there again, he's like, unify, you guys need to unify, endeavor to keep the unity. And just a few verses later in Ephesians 4, he says, And he himself gave some to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the church. Right? 
It's how we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. But basically what he's getting at, he says, hey, some people in the church, they've been given, you know, this position. Some have been given this position. Some this position. Some, you know, there's all these different functions of the church. Stop worrying about what you aren't doing and think about what God gave to you, your gift, to, to participate in the unifying of the body because it basically says we are one body and we're all knit together and it takes a whole body and every part of the body to make the body function properly, right? So be unified. That, that's basically what his message is here in this chapter. So going back to Ephesians 2, and we're going to look at the first two verses. We're going to kind of pick this apart a little bit. He says in 11 and 12, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Therefore, again, remembering all that he did, okay, he says that you were once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the circumcision. Now, this is derogatory, okay? It may not be real obvious, but, it, you know, the stuff I went back and studied, basically what you had was these Jewish believers that were coming to faith and these Gentile believers that were coming to faith, and it's like, well, where are the circumcision? You're, you're of the uncircumcision, you know? And, and you think about that. When you think about the derogatoriness of that, if that's a word, derogatoriness, um, <laughs> is it? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, you think about somewhere else where you, you think of the word uncircumcision being used. You know, how about when David went out to the battlefield with Goliath, right? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Right? And so this was this attitude that was prevailing. You had this you had this division among Gentiles and Jews, and it was quite serious. It was deep founded, it was deep seated, this division between Jews and Gentiles. The Jews thought that they were now God actually chose the Jewish people, right? He he created the Jewish people to reveal his glory to the world, right? But what happened because of our sinful nature is that they were like, well, we're God's people and you're not, right? And, and this prevailed and it continued on. And you, and you can see if you think about, you think about you know, certain scriptures um, throughout the Bible where this is revealed, um, you, you, can, you, can, you can think about the, the, the man who fell the thieves on the road uh, to Jericho. And, and the, you know, the priests came and they saw him laying on, and what'd they do? <laughs> Don't go near him, right? They didn't care about him. All they cared about was maybe their cleanliness or their, you know, whatever, their holiness. Um, and, and in fact, when um, you remember the text about when Jesus met the woman at the well, right? Where did he meet her? Where? Samaria. Samaria. And what did she say? What are you doing, a Jew, speaking to a Samaritan? Right? So when the Jews traveled from Judah north to Galilee, they didn't go through there. They went around it because those unclean Samaritans, those half breeds, right? So they, they didn't even recognize these, they were their brethren that were half Jewish. They didn't, they were, you guys are bad. You're, you're not good people. We don't, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Now, this, conf, this went even further with the Gentiles. They really had a really bad sentiment towards, towards Gentile people. And, and it was pervasive. And it was both directions. It wasn't just one way. It was, it was both directions. Now, I, and I, told, I told Darren I wanted to try to do this. And, and I, I, want to try, I really want to try and go this because you'll, you'll get a picture, a really, really very clear picture of what some of this Jewish sentiment was. I wanted to go through the book of Jonah. And, and I want to go through it. It's very short. Uh, and so I'm just going to read it, but I'm, I'm actually going to skip chapter two because that's Jonah's prayer, and it doesn't really um, relate to what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here. Um, so I'm just going to read one, three, and four. All right, and it's a very short book, and so we can go through this in probably five minutes. But you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, so if you want to go there, you can turn to the book of Jonah. Do 
Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jose, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a hint. <laughs> All right. Are right, we getting there? Yeah. You, know, it's, it's, you, you, you learn those little Bible songs like that, and they, and they you know, you remember them forever, right? There's something about the tune going with it, and then you can, you can, you can where's Jonah? Daniel, Jose, oh, James, Omadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. <laughs> you go through, right? All right. Are we there? All right. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, I think that's how you say it, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Nineveh would be a, a Gentile city, right? Uh, so he's speaking to a Jew, telling him to go to a Gentile city. And Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So what did he do? God told him to go east, and he went west. <laughs> right? So, flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down, uh, let me see. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God, perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, Sorry. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more temp tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm before you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore he cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not, let, and do not charge us with the innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done this as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So what you have here is God calling Jonah to go to a, a Gentile city, a wicked Gentile city, and preach to them. He's supposed to go east. He goes west. He says he's trying to flee from the presence of God. God cre creates a great storm. Now, rather than Jonah saying, maybe I ought to go do what God told me to do. He says, throw me overboard. Kill me. <laughs> this is how bad it is, okay? This is how bad he, he feels about these Gentile people. Throw me overboard. I would rather die. All right? <clears throat> so he gets swallowed up by the fish. God creates a fish. And the, the very last verse in chapter 2 says, so the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonas out onto dry land. And then in chapter 3, he says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach, preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose, arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day 
first day's walk. And then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock nor taste anything. Do not let them eat, drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let every one of them turn from his evil way from the from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said would, he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Chapter 4, let's look at Jonah's response. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He became angry. And so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. You would think those would be good things, right? <laughs> <clears throat> for some people. One who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He doesn't really think much of these people, does he? You saved them. They're Gentiles, God. And you, and you cried out to them, and, and now you're not going to destroy them. I was hoping you would destroy them. And now you made me do this. You made me do this, and now they're not going to destroy them. Yeah, kill me. That's how he feels. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Verse 4, Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun rose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, is it right for me to be angry? It is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and much livestock? So you can see this, this sentiment that, that was kind of you know, pervasive um, through the Jewish community or the Jewish, belief, or Jewish, Jewish people towards, uh, towards Gentiles. They really didn't think much of them. And that went both ways. And, and it's, it's chronic, okay? It continues even to this day. Let me, and, and, I'm, and I'm not doing this because I'm trying to spite somebody or say something negative about anybody because I'm, 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 that's not the point. But back in the Reformation, which was led by Martin Luther, he, early on in when, when the Reformation was occurring, he really reached out to the Jewish people. He was a, a, a German theologian, right, German scholar. Um, so that's important to know that he was German. Um, but he was a German scholar, and, and he had really you know, deep understanding of the scriptures, in particular the Old Testament. And so he really had a heart for the Jewish people. And so he wanted to reach out to the Jewish people. But it didn't work. What, what he was trying to do, he, he wasn't accomplishing. And so his mindset turned, and he began to hate the Jewish people uh, because they, weren't, he was, they were not converting to Christ as he wanted them to do. And it got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse. Uh, and, and he has said, he said several things, and I want to I read for you um, some of these, these um, quotes that came from 
um, from Martin Luther. And, you know, Martin Luther is a hero of the faith, obviously, because, because of the Reformation and the separation from, you know, the Catholic Church and the bondage that came under there and, you know, grace by faith and alone. Um, but he really did have a, a bad feeling towards the Jews. Um, here's one of the things he said. He said, I, I have published this little book so that I, I might be found among those who oppose such poisonous activities of the Jews. Set fire to their synagogues or their schools and bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom so that God might see that we are Christians. I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed for they pursue in them the same aims as in their synagogues. Instead, they might be lodged under a roof or in a barn like the gypsy, gypsies. This will bring home to them that they are not the masters of our country, as they boast, but they are all living in exile and in captivity, as incessantly wail and lament about, about us before God. I advise that usury be prohibited to them, and that all cash and treasury of silver and gold be taken from them. They have no other means of earning a livelihood than usury, and by it they have stolen and robbed from us all they possess. He says, I idle away their time behind the stove, feasting and farting, and on top of all, boasting blasphemy of their lordship. Save our souls from the Jews, that is, from the devil. They are our public enemies. These are multiple quotes that were made by Martin Luther about the Jewish people. So it goes both ways. You had this deep-seated, you know, these people despised each other. And, and it is said that um, a lot of the was done and written by Martin Luther in Germany is what basically what inspired Hitler to do what he did. And that was hundreds of years later, like 500 years later, right? So something like that, four or 500 years later. So this continues and it continues on today. There is this, just this division among believers whether they be Jewish believers or Gentile believers or, you know, Baptist, Presbyterian, you name it. There's just division. And Paul was trying to address this division. And so that's why, you know, this, this statement when he said, um, you know, he called it uncircumcision by the circumcision. He's talking about this, this is derogatory language that he's using. He says, you guys have to stop this. You have to stop this. You are all now made one in Christ. So this is the unity he's trying to bring together. This is a deep-seated division. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, let's pick it back up in Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll see how this is playing out in this text. Chapter 2, verse 13, he says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. All right? You were once far off, but you have now been brought near. You were once separated. You, you, you saw these laws of these commandments and these ordinances as something that separated you from the commonwealth of God and of Israel. That is gone. All right. And what he's saying that, you know, that verse 11 where it says, therefore, therefore, based on all this stuff that God has done for you to bring you into the kingdom. Can you not can you not lay aside this anti-Semitism? Can you not lay aside your hatred for these people? Can you not unify in one body, in one spirit and come together in the unity of the spirit to love one another and proclaim a loving God to the world? Can't you do that? 
He is our peace. He is our peace. A political solution is not our peace. A political, a political solution to the Russian-Ukraine war is not our peace. A political solution to $5 a gallon gas is not our peace. A political solution to the chaos and the corruption in worldwide government, it's not our peace. He is our peace. He is our peace. He's really striking this home. You guys have to stop being divided over these little things that separated you. This deep-seated division and hatred, it's got to go. There's no place for it in the kingdom of God. He is our peace. Who has made both one, and he broke down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, which was the law of the commandments. So this middle wall of separation, this is a reference to the temple. Okay, so in the temple, um, in Herod's temple in particular, there was a, you know, the, the way they constructed the temple, you had this huge outer court area. And in and, and the outer court, that was open to anybody. Okay, Jews, Gentiles alike, they could go in there. And, and in fact, this, if, when you go back and you read through the, the Gospels, when Jesus went into the temple and he was overturning the money tables and all that, he was in the outer court. He was in the court out there where, where it was just a mass of, people from every walk of life and, and every you know, belief or whatever. Um, so so you, Jews, Gentiles, everybody could be in this outer court. Um, and then <clears throat> as, you need, as you started to approach the temple, there was only one way into it. And, and then you went into the next court, which would have been the court of the women, and then the next court would have been the court of the men, and then the next court would have been the court of the priests, which would be the, uh, the, the, the court where the uh, brazen altar and the, the bronze laver and all that was. Uh, so that was the only priest to go in there to do the sacrifices and things like that. And then, of course, then you got to the actual temple itself, and you went into the, the, the holy place, okay, where you had the... Um, Menor, menorah and the table showbread and the, and the altar of incense and then you had the veil and then behind the veil the holy of holies so this is basically the entrance going out from this outer court that basically surrounded it where anybody could be to the women's court men's court and so forth and so on well between the outer court and the women's court was a wall and it was said to be about four and a half feet five feet tall and it was marked very clearly no gentiles beyond this spot and beyond this place, okay? You couldn't go in there. It was forbidden for any Gentiles. And if you remember in Acts, later, somewhere in the well, mid, middle, later uh, section of Acts, uh, Paul was actually accused of taking a Gentile past the middle wall of separation, if you remember that, um, and when he didn't. But anyways, uh, that's what they're talking about. This is the middle wall of separation. You now, as a Gentile, you couldn't go past that spot. So he's broken down the middle wall of separation. That's what that's referring to. You now, through Christ, can go from the outer court and access all the way, basically to the, the Holy of Holies, right? Because the, temple, the, the, the curtain has been torn as well. That's what he's getting at. Um, and now in Christ... We're now children of God through faith of Abraham, and all those barriers have been removed. All right, so we are now all of Abraham's seed, and that's what he's getting at. Uh, if you want, <clears throat> you can jot down these scriptures. I'm, I'm, uh, Galatians 3, 5 to 9, and then Galatians 3, 22 to 29. It basically talks about how you are the seed, or you are God's seed. You're the seed of Abraham through faith in Christ, okay? So... A Jewish non-believer is not of the seed of Abraham, okay? A Gentile believer is of the seed of Abraham. A Jewish believer is of the seed of Abraham, okay? Because we've all been made one by Christ. And again, you can, you can think about scriptures and go back and think about these things. Um, uh, when Jesus was having a confrontation with the, with the Pharisees, right? And, and they said, you're a child of fornication, and, and, and they said, well, we're, we're, we're children of, of Abraham. We're a child of Abraham. And what did Jesus say back to them? You're the son of the devil. 
you know, you're not the son of Abraham, you're the son of the devil. So right there, it's, it's very clear that, that to be a seed of Abraham is through faith in Christ. And in, now, that you're, now that you're a seed of Abraham and in Christ, you have access to all the promises and benefits that come along with that. Okay. If you read those texts in Galatians, you'll see that. In Christ, we are all one, and there should be no division, not no Jew, no Gentile. Um, and he says, well, let me, let me, let me just get to catch the end of chapter 3. Um, in 28, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the, the promise. So no Jew, no Gentile, no slave, no free, no male, no female, no black, no white, no Asian, no Hispanic. We're all one in Christ. No Baptist, no Presbyterian, no Methodist, no Lutheran, no non-denominational <laughs> tongue twister. We're all one. We are all one. And we have to break down these balls of division between us. We are all one. The building cannot grow. Well, we can get to that. We're going to get to that because he speaks on this in the next text, in the next scripture. But we all have to be one for it to all function properly, right? So let's go on. In verse 17, he says, And he came and preached peace to you who are afar off and to those who were near both to the Gentile and to the Jews. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fit together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So here Paul is clearly not speaking about a building, a physical block and mortar building. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about something else when he's talking about a holy temple being built with Jesus being the chief cornerstone, right? If you um, remember back to when <clears throat> Solomon wanted to build the temple, right? Well, David wanted to buy it, but he had built it, buy it. He wanted to build it, but he had too much blood on his hands. Uh, and so it was left to Solomon. To actually, David got all the provisions, but it was left to Solomon to build uh, the temple. And so Solomon goes about that task. Um, and in one of the comments he says in Second Chronicles in chapter 2, he says, but who is able to build him a temple since heaven and, and the heavens of heavens cannot contain him? So it's very obvious that a building cannot contain God, right? So he wanted to build a building for him. But when Paul is talking about this temple that's being built, he's clearly not talking about a physical building. He's talking about something else. And you know what he's talking about, right? Because um, Paul further explains that to us in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3, in verses 16 and 17. He says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in, in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And then in 6, 19 to 20, he says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So he's talking about this building, this building together, but he's talking about us as believers, us, the people who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, God's people in many walks of life, in, in, in many different practices of the way they believe. You have to come to unity. You have to come to unity. We cannot continue to, tr to, to be destroying each other and expect that this building is going to grow up into this glorious you know, building of, for God, right? Of which Jesus is the, the chief cornerstone. So I want to close with a couple thoughts here. 
The first one is that Paul is making the case that both Gentiles and Jewish believers has, have access to God's promises by faith in Christ. But making sure that the divisions between Jewish believers and Gentile believers would end. That's primarily what he was dealing with in this text. This vehement hatred for one another. You got both Jewish believers and now new Gentile believers coming into the church, and we have to end this. I'm not going not gonna to go there. That's another tangent. But um, Christ's church is not divided, right? You can think text there, right? Can, can yeah, can a house divided stand? The, the, the opposing views cannot, I mean, they oppose, right? They're, they're grinding at each other. They're fighting at each other. A, vice, a house divided can't stand. And if the church is going to stand, the divisions have to go away. You know, and, and deep-seated divisions have to go away. This hatred for Gentiles, this anti-Semitism, it has to go away. There's, it, it's very clear that that, that, that this exists contemporarily. There are um, messianic congregations, right? Uh, Jewish congregations that are attended by a lot of Gentile people. And we come in contact with a lot of these Gentile people who are constantly telling us that you have to do this, you have to do that. How come you don't meet on Saturday? How come blah, 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 blah. And, and it's like, don't you know what the scriptures, the scriptures say this? And it's like, well, I can show you the scriptures. That, and well, what, but what about this? Well, well, what about this scripture? And, you know, and it's like, there's this like, why are we fighting? You know, I mean, you listen, if, you, if you've, if you found your home as a Gentile in, in a messianic congregation, that makes you feel comfortable. And, and the essential that Christ is Savior and Christ alone is Savior, God bless you. You know, don't try to convert me to what you believe, and I'm not, I won't try to convert you to what I believe if we stand strong on the essentials of the faith. If there's a division in the essential, then we're, we're divided. If you're going to tell me it's Christ plus, if you're going to tell me that you have to be circumcised, you're going to tell me you have to keep the law, well, we got a problem now. I don't, I don't think we even have a, a place to talk about any longer. But if it's Christ and it's Christ alone, and you happen to, I don't know, enjoy the Jewishness of, of you know, what was being offered by a Messianic congregation, God bless you. You know? We don't have to fight over that. Why do we need to fight over that? I'm not going to fight you over that. It's not worth it. Christ's church is not divided. And though we all might be quite different, we all need one another. We all need one another. We all need one another in, in differences in our, our, our belief systems or different things we embrace. I mean, some people believe in, you know, whatever. I'm, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to go to this church because they embrace, a, you know, pre-rapture tribulation. And I, and I don't believe that. I believe it's a, a mid-trib. Okay, well, God bless you. Go to a church that teaches that. You know, but that's not something that divides us, right? It doesn't believe, it doesn't, you're not comfortable here because of whatever our, dis, our dispensational beliefs. Go to a church that uh, caters to your dispensational beliefs. But we don't have to be divided over that. Christ is our Savior, right? He'll, he'll straighten it out. He's going to straighten us all out. We're all messed up, right? <clears throat> He's going to straighten us out. But we need each other. The building is not complete without each other. And that goes now outside these walls, and it goes for within inside these walls. I mean, you guys can look back and forth up the aisle at one another, or behind you, or in front of you, and go, I need that person. I need that person. I need that person. I need that person. We need you. We need you. We need you, young folks. We need you. We need you. We need you. We need people like you who go downtown, <laughs> bold, boldly proclaiming God's, you know, God's word to lost people. That's not everybody's gift. It's your gift. We need you. We all need each other. The building is not complete if we are all not here, if we're all not together. Christ is the chief cornerstone. That's our foundation. That's what we're built on. 
And then secondly, we need to take assessment of our temple. Are we comfortable out in the outer court? That's where, you know, that's where everybody is. That's where all the masses are. That's where all just the mundane conversation takes place. That's where the money changing goes on. That's where ripping people off for their sacrifice happens. All the stuff goes on out there in the outer court. Are we comfortable out there? Is that where we like to hang out? Or do we want to just cut through that spot because I got a place I want to go? Remember Joshua? He'd go to the temple or the tabernacle with Moses, and he didn't want to leave. I'm staying here, right? I want to go, I want to go beyond this outer court. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We can boldly come before the throne of grace in our time of need. Yeah, we can come before him. That the, the, the veil is torn. Right past the middle wall of separation, right through the court of women, right through the court of men, right through the priest area, straight into the temple, into the Holy of Holies. That's where you have access to. You are a believer. You have access. God gave you access. Are we comfortable out in the outer court? It's a question. And I'm not saying this in a kind of condemning way to anybody because there's a lot of times I'm hanging out there in the outer court, you know? And we need to get out of that. We need to get out of the outer court. Let's get out of the mundane life of the outer court. You know, a lot of the conversation that probably goes on in the outer court is what we were just talking about. Man, I wish the government would do something about. Government needs to do something about. You know, if they would just, we could fix. Maybe we had a worldwide monetary system. Maybe that would do it. What about climate change? Hey, if everybody just got vaccinated, there's a big division right there, right? Man, that's all, that's all, in, the, that's all in the outer court. That's not a court conversation. Isn't it? That's stuff that's dividing us. What's, what's, what's the discussion in the inner court? Jesus. The discussion in the inner court is what verse 11 started with. Therefore. It's all of what he did in chapter 1. That's the inner court discussion. Our court discussion is divisive. The inner court discussion is about Jesus. That's where we need to go. We're going to close with that. Take me past the outer court into the holy place. Amen. Amen.